Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and especially our good friends of the Joseph and Alma Gildenhorn Aspen Book Series. Uh, today is a very special day. It marks the final uh, conversation in our book series after 17 years. Uh, since 2004, we have presented over 200 programs with a stellar list of authors and their books. Uh, it initially started with a small group. We were bringing people into the Aspen Institute to meet us and to know us. And from the small group, we have grown and grown to being one of the best book and author luncheons in the area. Uh, I've we could not have done this without the uh, management and uh, help of Jim Spiegelman and his team who conducted uh, the search for great books and great authors for 15 years. Uh, he has been succeeded by Libby Franklin and Chris Homer. And they too have carried on in that tradition of excellence, which has made the Gildenhorn book series a go-to event at the Aspen Institute. And for that, we're very, very proud. And so it's with um, sweet memories that I always treasure that I say farewell to this book series, but with an added treat, an outstanding uh, book and author, and a fantastic um, moderator in conversation with our author. Our author today is my dear friend uh, and husband's great friend, Jane Harmon. Jane Harmon is a trustee of the Aspen Institute and she is invaluable uh, to our board. Uh, she was a congresswoman for 18 years from California. She distinguished herself there as being on every foreign service uh, and national security uh, committee that the Congress has. She served with distinction and uh, is a recognized authority on intelligence and national security matters. For the past 10 years until her retirement recently, Jane used her brilliance and her leadership skills to be the CEO, president, and uh, director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Today, uh, we are going to present Jane's book, Insanity Defense, to moderate um, this book, this wonderful book, is none other than another Aspen All-Star, Ambassador Nicholas Burns. Ambassador Burns is the Goodman Professor of the Program for Diplomacy and International Relations at the Harvard Kennedy School. He is deeply involved in Aspen as director of the Aspen Security uh, Group and also the Aspen Strategy Group. Uh, two of the most important programs that we have at the Institute. Uh, prior to his going to Kennedy and being a part of our Aspen family, he was uh, a dedicated member of the US Foreign Service. In that capacity, um, he served as spokesperson for the Department of State he was U.S. Ambassador to Greece, NATO, and he was also, and most importantly, Undersecretary for Political Affairs at the Department of State. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure and what an honor to introduce two incredible people to you today. And this is my special treat to each of you for being such devoted uh, followers 
of our Gildenhorn book series. It is my great pleasure now to turn this over to Ambassador Burns. Thank you so much. Alma, thank you so much. And thanks to you and Joe for sponsoring this book series for the Aspen Institute for so long. I didn't realize that you started it in 2004. And I think both Jane and I are really privileged yeah. to be part of it and to be part of the very last one of these book interviews. So thank you for everything you and Joe have done and continue to do for the Aspen Institute. What a pleasure it is for me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to welcome all of you, to welcome you to um, this discussion of a book by my very good and close and longtime friend, Congresswoman Jane Harmon. The book is called Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. Less safe. I was really taken by your book. Um, you know, it's, an, it's informed because of your experience. It's interesting because you brought a lot of these specific crises that you face as a member of Congress into it. It's also very frank. And one of your central themes of this book is that the United States in both parties has yeah. not managed effectively to transform itself from a Cold War oriented country to a post-Cold War oriented country in a very complex age when American power is still, it's strong in the world, but we have competitors that are approaching us in many aspects of power. So if, if that is one of your central themes, I took it away. Is this why you wrote the book? Yes. Uh, when I left Congress um, 10 years ago, imagine, uh, it was in my mind that I wanted to sum up uh, some of my experiences, good and bad. And as I say in the book, I had some successes. I had some failures in Congress. But then I got so busy at the Wilson Center, I had to defer until the quarantine. I like to say the only good thing for me personally out of this horrible quarantine was the chance to sit in, in this little guest house uh, that I have in Washington and write the book, uh, which I had been thinking about for so long. But yes, that's why I, I wrote the book. And, and just to make a point, uh, I say, and I, I believe this, that Joe Biden is the first experienced foreign policy president we have had uh, since George H.W. Bush. The last four presidents had their pluses and minuses. Here I am, you know, the, the bipartisan person, uh, their pluses and minuses, but none of them had uh, deep experience like Joe Biden, and none of them had the A team that he has put together. And it really matters as the problems in the world are even more more dangerous than they were in uh, when the Cold War ended in in in, in uh, 1990. So Jane, um, both you and I are very strong supporters of the United States uh, military, of our intelligence communities. We could not succeed as a country without them. Right. But there's a third element of national power which in many ways, I think administrations and Congresses have disregarded, underfunded, underutilized, that's diplomacy. And you talk in the book about the over-militarization of our foreign policy, particularly since 9-11, when we came out swinging in the two big land wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, how do we course correct now? And, and I certainly see President Biden and Secretary Tony Blinken trying to build up the State Department. And I'm so much in favor of that as a Foreign Service officer retired, can we accomplish that quickly enough to make the kind of difference we need to make? Um, I hope so. Uh, let's give a shout out to Joe Nye, who is a co-chair of the Aspen Strategy Group and one of our uh, other dear friends who coined the terms hard power and soft power and actually smart power. But diplomacy is our soft power and it has been underinvested. Uh, we have underinvested in it for years. But let me just back up a bit, because when the Cold War ended, I, I was in the first post-Cold War class in Congress, and we thought we, the United States, declared a peace dividend, if anybody can remember this. And we downsized under George H.W. Bush, the defense and intelligence procurement budgets. And here I got elected to what I used to call the aerospace center of the universe, where we make most of our intel intelligence satellites in Southern California. And the triple PhDs who won the Cold War uh, we're out of work. I mean, it was a disaster. And we had to figure out uh, how to retain them and how to keep our uh, defense and aerospace base intact. And um, uh, Ron Dellums, who was then the chair of the House Armed Services Committee on which I served, former Marine who represented Berkeley, California, put that together. 
uh, said, we don't have a ro roadmap here for the post-Cold War world. And he was right. And we didn't. And so during the decades of the 90s, as I described, we missed the rise of China. We missed the rise of terrorism. Not totally, but we thought China wanted to be us. They didn't and they don't. Uh, we thought that the terrorism problem was modest. It wasn't and it isn't. And they'd still like to, uh, if they could, mount major attacks against us. And then came 9-11. And, and Dick Cheney was vice president, and I talked extensively about this. Uh, he felt uh, that uh, the sort of the so-called unitary executive, that the president's power was crucial and that it trumped anything Congress might do. Of course, I was then in Congress, ranking member on House uh, Intelligence, uh, and he took actions uh, far beyond uh, what the law uh, authorized in certain respects. And we're still stuck with that the endless wars. And I was wrong. I say this in the book. Uh, Sidney Harmon was right. The late Sidney Harmon. Many of you are going to smile when I say this. When I came home one night and I said, Sidney, I'm going to vote for the Iraq war resolution. He said, you're going to do what? And I said, Sidney, I've read all the intelligence. I, I thoroughly uh, 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 evaluated the national intelligence estimate. I saw the, back, you know, the backup materials. I traveled to England. I traveled to the Middle East. And it is clear to me that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and could use them against us. And Sydney's deathless prose was, that's a lot of crap. And I said, how do you know? You have no expertise in this. And he said, you'll see. So my point is, I made mistakes. The intelligence was wrong, I was wrong. Uh, and we made mistakes as a country and we are climbing out of it. And to answer you, Nick, that was a little long. Uh, Joe Biden has a nuanced view of this. And by surging soft power, uh, picking hopefully good ambassadors all over the world who have deep experience in the countries where they are going uh, and can uh, explain uh, U.S., explain to those countries U.S. interests and explain those countries' interests to the U.S. It's a two-way street. Uh, we are going to do uh, what you're talking about, which is to make up for this gigantic deficit. You know, all of us have been talking about Iraq and Afghanistan really for two decades now. And it is so much easier when you're out of government, like I am, for instance, and you are, to look back and say it was a mistake. But you have the added burden, and I do too. You voted for it, and I supported the Iraq War Resolution uh. by Congress. I was ambassador to NATO at the time. I thought it was the right thing for us to do. Um, we can't go back and replay that film. But we can, as Americans, focus in 2021 and how do we go forward? Yeah. One of the big decisions that President Biden has made is to decide that the United States is taking all of its combat forces out of, uh, of Afghanistan and effectively ending that 20 year war. Do you agree with uh, the president and the administration that, that, that that's the right decision for us? I do. And to give so, some credit to President Trump, the former President Trump, let me stress that. Uh, he was the one who made the decision that we were going to move, uh, pull our troops out of uh, out of Afghanistan, and he was negotiating that. And there was a May first deadline, which has now been extended to uh, September 11. I think that's very smart, and we're doing it in a much more orderly way. But I would call that move uh, the least bad option. There are no good options for us in Afghanistan. Uh, we did the right thing by going in. Uh, Congress passed almost unanimously an authorization to use military force in Afghanistan, which, oh, by the way, we have used to justify 40 military missions in 19 countries since, although Congress never focused on that. And they're against some of the groups that didn't even exist on 9-11, uh, uh, which I think is pretty irresponsible. But at any rate, um, pulling our troops out, but staying in the region, building uh, stronger alliances, uh, keeping our intelligence going, uh, enforcing human rights as a plank of our foreign policy so that if the Taliban or some new government uh, uh, goes after girls and women, uh, we have uh, the ability to respond is the least bad strategy. And I uh, hope it goes well. The government is fragile. Uh, the Taliban has been attacking on our watch anyway, uh, tribalism is, it has never not been part of Afghanistan's story. And I think we underestimated it when we, when we came into Afghanistan and we overstayed in terms of our military mission. 
Thank you. Jane, um, when you were in Congress, when I was serving at state and, and beyond in our present lives, most of us have thought about the fight against terrorism, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, the various offshoot groups, as the primary threat to the security of the United States. President mm -hmm. Trump, um, I think encouraged by Secretary Jim Mattis, um, made a transition in 2017 yeah. saying terrorism is fundamentally important. It's a critical uh, imperative but there's a higher imperative to the United States. And they declared this in the national security strategy in 2017 and on. And that is China and Russia, the two great authoritarian powers are the, the most important threat to the long-term security of the country. It seems in, in a Washington where, and you know this very well, Republicans and Democrats can't agree on very much that most senior Republicans and Democrats agree with this change, that China and Russia are the primary threats is that your view? And how would you talk about both of them, um, Xi Jinping and okay. Putin? How should we handle them? Well, I was on Jim Mattis' uh, defense policy board when that uh, national security strategy came out. I remember him saying uh, that this is a long overdue course correction. We also were hoping at the time that we could keep uh, the China threat separate from the Russia threat. Uh, I think we're doing a little better, but uh, having you know that the the double threat is is not is 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 not helpful to us. Um, but I agreed with that change. I also agree, uh, as as Joe Biden says uh, in the interim national security uh, strategy that Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan rolled out a couple months ago, that we got to add a few more things, and they include climate uh, and the pandemic. Let's not miss that. I mean, that has been a catastrophic threat. Uh, to our national security and world security, uh, and that we also should, it should add uh, domestic terrorism. I mean, terrorism, yes, has been a threat. We, we, we thought about it in the past in terms of foreign terrorism, but there's no question that, that extremism, uh, both on the, on the right and the left, I think much more on the right, is extremely dangerous in our country. And by doing that, by the way, they made foreign policy more relevant to average Americans. As I put it, they took the foreign out of foreign policy. Uh, so what should we do about China and Russia? I, I think in, a, again, a nuanced way, we need to be tougher on China. And Congress is behind the administration doing this. You're right, on a bipartisan basis. Uh, and we need to have a different strategy for Russia. Being tough, certainly, against this new wave of, of ransomware, if anyone is missing this movie, by criminal syndicates in Russia. Uh, Russia could crack down on these folks, oh, by the way, and they're not just a threat to the U.S. Uh, when the meeting happens this month, I think it's this month, between uh, Putin and Biden, I hope he will be very tough there, but also open the door for cooperation, for example, in the Arctic and places where we have more common interests. Is that true of China as well? Are we still talking about, we're not talking about unremitting competition, I think competition is the primary strategy towards both of them. But with both, we need to work on climate change. We need to right. operate in the pandemic, however frustrating that has been with the Chinese who have not been transparent and not been open. But is, is it a combination of the two with most of the emphasis on competition? How do you see it? I, I do. I, I, that's a fair uh, comment. Uh, I think cooperate where we can, compete where we must. Uh, and confront where we must. I think beating war drums is completely counterproductive. Uh, but I think uh, China's actions in some ways are completely unacceptable. Uh, the treatment of the Uyghurs is a massive human rights violation. The treatment of Hong Kong is another massive human rights violation. The building up of these uh, uh, bases, these island bases in South and East China Sea uh, that were before that just little rocks and that impinge on the international waters of that region uh, where uh, the countries of the region can claim uh, some, some, some right to travel. Uh, they're all uh, bad actions. And, and the stealing of our IP is another one of those. And oh, by the way, I, I now have a, a more open mind about where the uh, coronavirus came from. At least I think all this unexamined intel needs to be examined and we need to know absolutely that it wasn't developed in a lab that was near that wet market in, in Wuhan. But let me say one other thing about what Trump is doing, what, but what Trump didn't do and what Biden is doing, which is uh, searching our relationships in the region. The use of the quad uh, is, is a very smart 
action, Australia, Japan, uh, India, and us uh, in the region. And you know, rebuilding those alliances that were ignored uh, in the last administration will help us in, in, in a good way uh, deal with the China issue. I agree with you, Jane. I think that President Biden's new renewed emphasis on allies and on partnerships, that strengthens the United States. We shouldn't want to be alone in the world or go it alone. And we have these natural made alliances, 28 European countries in Canada and NATO, Australia, Japan, South Korea, treaty alliances, you and I know, yes. a big security partner. And I really value what President Biden is doing in that regard. He's also doing something else, Jane, that I wanted to ask you about. He, from, from the, from the um, swearing in speech from his, uh, in, on January 20th, mm -hmm. his inaugural address to his first press conference at the State Department, his State of the Union speech, he has spoken passionately about democracy. Democracy yes. at home, of course, but also democracy globally. And um, he, he always raises it in counterpoint to these very self-confident authoritarian powers who of course are extinguishing human freedom um, not every president has made democracy right. a calling card of the foreign policy. Is the president right to do that here? Totally right. And I think the sanctions on Belarus uh, in light of this, uh, I would call kidnapping uh, of, uh, of, a, of a, a, a press critic on an airplane that was overflying Belarus airspace right, is right. And, you know, let me, let me call out one other thing because it's happening this week. And that is what's going on in Israel. Uh, Israel is possibly, we'll see, you know, as Yogi Berra says, it ain't over till it's over, uh, changing its government, figuring out a rainbow coalition of eight parties, including an Arab party, uh, to succeed Bibi Netanyahu and finally end the paralysis that's been going on for two years. Uh, I don't think it's my right to tell the Israelis what to do, and I'm kind of horrified that a few members of the Senate are flying over there to show solidarity with Bibi. Uh, but, I, but I think what this shows is that in a country like Israel, with a history of being a pluralist democracy, there still is this latent or maybe now active sense that they can do better. And I think that's happening here. And I think that is a, uh, a core value of people in the world. And having Biden speak to this is, is very impressive. And again, he brings huge knowledge uh, to the subject, having met most uh, world leaders over decades and decades in Congress and as vice president. Well, Jane, as you're, um, you're speaking, Colleen Fleming has asked a question in the um, Q&A. And um, Colleen, if you would like to ask that in person, I think we'd like to bring you up right now because it's very relevant um, to, what, to what Jane was just talking about. Thank you for this really fascinating discussion. And I've listened to both of you for many years and really appreciate this conversation. Uh, I currently work at the State Department, full disclosure, and um, I work on the Middle East and North Africa. So I have grave concerns about uh, the recent events. And as you just stated, um, that gives me hope in Israel, but I also um, want to know what, what you think the way forward is with Iran, because we really need to talk to our allies in order to, mm -hmm. to make peace. So thank you. Thanks, Colleen. Jane. Well, I think Nick, you should opine on this too, because uh, you're extremely knowledgeable, but let me just say that I supported the JCPOA. And I understand why that wasn't popular uh, in some quarters. And I do understand that it wasn't everything. It was a transactional deal, not transformational. We didn't curb Milan, uh, Iran's malign behavior. Surely we didn't. We can still see it in the region, including teaching Hamas how to build those rockets that it just shot at Israel, which is shameful and wrong. Uh, but it accomplished at least containment of the nuclear program. I thought that President, former President Trump should have built on that agreement and made it stronger. I thought we had the, the traction to do that. Uh, once it was ended and Iran uh, went backwards, uh, I think Joe Biden is right to try to put something together again, but it can't be the end point. It has to be the starting point of a bigger regional deal. And I'm from California. In fact, I'm in California talking right now, looking at the Pacific Ocean and you're not. Uh, but I'm just saying that the tectonic plates shift here. We have earthquakes. And I think the Middle East is having one. 
Uh, I don't think the Arab Spring was it, but I think now with realignment of, of Sunni states in Israel, uh, now with our leaving Afghanistan, uh, with our trying to do something with Iran, with our reaching uh, for allies again, there could be some way to use carrots and sticks, not just sticks, uh, to, among other things, curb Iran's malign behavior. Um, thank you, Colleen. And Jane, Colleen's question is, is, is really interesting because what was implicit in it uh, was that we need to focus on the Middle East too. We can't forget it. Mm -hmm. Now, in the Aspen Strategy Group, some of our members have been saying for many years that we took a massive strategic detour into the Middle East after 9-11, and we forgot about the primacy of the Indo-Pacific for American security and economic and technology interests. Even I would say Europe, our largest trade partner, our largest group of allies, are those two regions, the Indo and Pacific and Europe, should they be primarily where we're focused? We can't focus everywhere uh, with maybe a, a lesser focus on the Middle East or is that not possible? Well, somebody quipped that uh, the Middle East is like the Hotel California. You can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. Right. Um, since I'm in California, that resonates. <laughs> and the Hotel California is near where I am. Uh, but at any rate, uh, yes, the answer to you, Nick, is yes. And uh, President Obama was right to move our focus to uh, closer term threats to the United States. I don't mean to be callous. And I am the daughter of a refugee from Nazi Germany. And I totally get uh, Israel's need to survive, but I would add, as a pluralist democracy, a Jewish state and a pluralist democracy. Uh, but I'm saying that uh, in terms of current and future threats against our country, uh, we have to focus on China, Russia, uh, uh, and, and uh, terrorism, and uh, the pandemic, uh, and climate. And uh, yes, we should keep an eye on what's going on in the Middle East, and we're going to do that. But it should be uh, pro to project more of our soft power and to, within a strategy that is that is focused on uh, what are the risks to us. Thank you very much, Jane. I want to bring Garrett Mitchell and then Olivia Tuttle in this conversation. Garrett has a question about, okay, <laughs> so given what you said, where does Iran and North Korea rank? This whole idea that we've got to stem, if not cut off entirely, the ability of both countries to become nuclear weapons weapons powers. Iran is not one yet. North Korea is one. Uh, Garrett, do you want to ask, ask your question? Thanks very much uh, to both of you, of course, uh, for all the things that were said earlier about what you've both done, which I greatly admire. Um, it, it's a very simple question in a sense, which is at a time when, uh, when the focus appears to be on China and Russia, it raises the question for me of where in, in our sort of strategic hierarchy, uh, we should think about uh, North Korea and Iran. Well, I appreciate that question. And Nick, I hope you will uh, augment my answer with your own, with your brilliance. Uh, but I, I would say a couple of things. Our North Korea strategy over years, over many presidencies has not been successful. A photo op is not a strategy and North Korea is uh, even on the uh, uh, on the watch of uh, former President Trump uh, was not uh, containing its uh, its activities and certainly isn't now. I think what uh, how we should think about this is the the uh, nuclear weapons are the Kim family's survival strategy. They want to survive. If they use those nuclear weapons, they won't survive. They will be obliterated. So let's understand that they are not they can they, you know rattle sabers and call us crazy and all the rest of it, but we should s stick to our plan, not, not move to their provocations. That would be my comment on them. What should we do about them? We're doing the right things. We are uh, resuming our joint military exercises with Korea, uh, South Korea, the Republic of Korea. Uh, we have authorized their development of longer term missiles. We are trying to reconcile them and the Japanese bitter memories of a uh, of the, of the war. And we are, it seems to me, uh, as Nick said earlier, uh, rebuilding in every possible way our alliances in Asia, which will curb both China's malign behavior and I think uh, make it clear to North Korea that if they want trade and if they want uh, any recognition in the world, they're going to have, have to change. And, you know, there is an opportunity for North Korea, which has a lot of smart people in it, 
to become a responsible citizen. I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow, uh, but I, I don't rule it out. Absolutely. And, and I, I think I commented on Iran already. You did. Thank you very much, Jane. Uh, Garrett, thank you for that. I want to ask Olivia Tuttle to speak. And um, yesterday, the National Endowment for Democracy named a new executive director, and it's our great friend, Damon Wilson. And uh, Damon has been deputy director of the Atlantic Council for the last 12 years. He has been singularly focused on the issue of human freedom in Eastern uh. Europe and democracy in Eastern Europe and to contain Russian power. This is a big moment for NDI, for the International Republican Institute, for the National Endowment, for all of us as Americans. How do we protect democracy? That's Olivia's question. Olivia, yeah. please take the floor. Yeah, thank you both so much for this conversation. Uh, really, really appreciate it. I would love to know more, um, elaborate a bit more on the strategies or tactics that the US can employ to combat these threats to democracy globally. And, you know, we had mentioned sanctions. Is this kind of the primary tactic? Are there other tactics we could employ? And also whether these tactics should be public or is that behind the scenes work more of a, uh, is that a smarter strategy, like you know, negotiations in Israel, um, et cetera? Mm -hmm. So thank you both. Well, answer to all of that is yes, 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 and yes. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Nick didn't mention the new director of the NED, the National Endowment for Dem Democracy, which is who is Ken Wallach, who for years, decades, uh, uh, ran the National Democratic Institute, and I am a gigantic fan of NDI and IRI and the NED, uh, which do so much uh, to build political capacity around the world. I've been on numerous uh, election observing trips with them. And, uh, and I think that is a, a, a wonderful piece of our soft power. And at least that has survived all these decades and hopefully now is growing. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I think sanctions are a good thing. And I, I think even more robust sanctions in many ways are a good thing, but they're difficult uh, to, to employ. We, in response to one of the big Russian attacks, uh, we went after their sovereign wealth fund, which apparently is how uh, President Putin uh, amasses wealth. Um, hmm, does it go to his personal accounts or where? Uh, and so that was a, a pretty painful thing for him. We could also block members of the Russian uh, 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 legislature from, from going, traveling to Europe, as an example, uh, owning property in the South of France and in, and in England. The problem with that is um, that hurts the economies of both countries, but hopefully they should be on the same side on trying to curb Russia's malign behavior. So there are more things we can do with sanctions, but I, I mentioned uh, carrots and sticks. I'd like to think, and I think Nick knows more about this than I do, that we could rejigger this a little, you know, and sanity defense is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Could, couldn't we rejigger it so that Iran, Russia, and others see an opportunity that if they curb their human rights violations uh, and are welcomed in certain ways uh, back to the world economy or back to uh, res uh, respectful status in the world, that that might entice them. I'm, I'm not Pollyanna here. I'm not saying that's all we should do, but I'm just wondering if there's any up side uh, to that. Jane's book that we're discussing is called Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. I hope you'll consider buying it and very importantly, reading it because I learned a lot from it. We have time for one more question, Jane. I'm going to take the prerogative of the floor, if you don't mind, uh, of the host, I should say myself, the, the questioner. At the end of every course I teach at the Harvard Kennedy School, when we go through an entire semester of talking about the most significant human challenges, war and peace challenges, technology, mm -hmm. cyber, et cetera, I asked, the, I asked the students, what are you hopeful about? What are the most hopeful global trend lines that you see around the world? Because I think in government, obviously we're paid first and foremost in government to defend the country, that's only right. But we also in the 21st century have to be have to think about advancing big human aspirations like yeah. um, like alleviating poverty, like eradicating polio and HIV uh, eventually uh, from from the world, like raising up women 
like working on diversity and so that people who have not had access to positions of power are given access, provided access. What are you hopeful about, Jane, as you look out in the world? Well, all the things you said, and, and oh, by the way, I'm, I'm spending this week uh, with four of my eight perfect grandchildren, just beside myself You're about the possibilities not. for young life and, yeah. and hoping that their world is much better than our world. Uh, so uh, <laughs> what can I say? But, but uh, on this point, I actually want to come back to the pandemic. And, and here's why I'm hopeful as dreadful as that has been to the whole world, not just to the United States, it has done a couple of things that I think are, are or at least three that I can think of that are very positive. Uh, number one, it's the great equalizer. Whether you're rich or poor, uh, you could still get COVID. And it doesn't matter where you live. I know it impacts uh, uh, po poverty neighborhoods more, but but there has been, uh, it has affected everybody that, and it has closed businesses and it has uh, kept us all home for a year uh, in the world. Uh, so it's the great equalizer and we haven't had that experience in a long time. And as horrible as it is, it opens the opportunity for a couple other things. Our way out of this pandemic is, uh, is uh, technology and it has introduced uh, technology, developing state-of-the-art vaccines figuring out the logistics to get them in arms, uh, uh, making uh, countries that were backward embrace the technology, leapfrogging some, some, some uh, um, things that we have done in a, wrong <laughs> over, over recent years. So it's done that. And the third thing that it has done, I think, is to open our eyes to why the world needs to work together to prevent the next pandemic. And so, I mean, all the things you said are right, Nick. I, I couldn't be more passionate about the, you know, the need for opportunity for girls and women who are more than half the population, which makes us more than half the talent pool. Uh, but I'm just saying there is this chance now that uh, the, this, this sort of uh, uh, notion of one world is more meaningful to people than it ever was. Thank you very much, Jane. And I know uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna end this um, wonderful talk with you with a, um, a video message from the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, our friend, uh, Dan Porterfield. But before I do, let's just call an audible. Um, and this is not meant to be political, but a final question to you. I went into government as a young person out of graduate school because I believed in the possibilities of government doing great things. And um, I feel that we have a president now who is, um, has the government operating at its very best. The government's performance since January 20th on the coronavirus in mobilizing all of our states and mobilizing our health authorities to vaccinate millions of Americans has been breathtaking. And I, I do hope, and I, I believe under President Biden's leadership and under the leadership of Republicans who are like-minded and many are in national security, that we can get our self-confidence back as a global power in foreign and defense policy. Your thoughts on that? Well, I went into government for the same reason you did. Uh, I was inspired because, get this, uh, and I, I, uh, as a young person, I went to the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles in 1960 and saw the nomination of John Kennedy to be president and met Eleanor Roosevelt. And I'm not making this up. And I was a young usher at Kennedy's acceptance speech, by the way. so. So was Nancy Pelosi. She came from a powerful political family. I came from an immigrant family and I didn't have any political connections, but that was my epiphany. And I have pursued that life ever since. And I agree with you. And let, let me close on this because we really didn't discuss Congress. I think the motivator for most people in both parties to go to Congress is to add value. It is really hard to be elected to Congress and to stay in Congress. And the tragedy of Congress right now, and it is something I hope we can all help work on, is that it is polarized and paralyzed and really good people in both parties uh, cannot make the difference they should be making. And it, it is my hope that the separation of powers, which was the brilliant concept of our founders to keep this form of a republic, remember a republic if you can keep it, is restarted soon and that Joe Biden, a creature of Congress in his bones can find the way to rebuild the bridges. 
Well, let's end up, let's end on that word of hope about our future as Americans, about the future of our great country. Jane, thank you. You've been such a good friend for so long, but not just because you're a friend, but because I admire what's in it. I recommend heartily this book, Insanity Defense by Jane Harmon. And thanks again to Alma and Joe Gildenhorn. Thanks to the Aspen Institute. Now we're gonna conclude with a, uh, a video message from our friend, Dan Porterfield. Thank you to everyone who joined us today for this final program of our wonderful book series that Alma and Joe have supported for so many years. And thank you to Jane and Nick for giving us such a rich and thoughtful conversation of Jane's book, Insanity Defense. The Asp Institute's purpose is to drive change towards a free, just, and equitable society. Inclusive dialogue is a core pillar of that purpose and has defined the work of the Institute since our founding in 1949. Since 2004, the Gildenhorn book series has been a critical component of that mission and representative of our efforts to bring people together across the supposed divides of difference for community, discussion, and progress. It has brought together remarkable individuals from Tom Wolfe and E.L. Doctorow, Doris Kearns Goodwin, Condoleezza Rice, Madeleine Albright, and so many other noted authors. And over these past 17 years, there have been a great number of colleagues who have made the Gildenhorn book series possible. Thank you especially to our colleague, Vice President and Chief of Staff, Jim Spiegelman, who led the series to great care and professionalism in its first 15 years. Thank you also to Jamie Miller, Linda Lair, Libby Franklin, and Kristen Cromer, who've overseen the program in the years since and adapted so successfully to convene the book series in a virtual mode while never losing sight of the importance of community. Thank you to all of you for your participation over these many years. Our utmost thanks, of course, go to Joe and Alma Gildenhorn, who have supported the Institute community with extraordinary generosity and friendship. Through them, the series has grown and flourished over the years. And although I've only been at the Institute for a short time, it has been remarkable to witness the series success and the pride we all feel in its work. Joe and Alma, you are wonderful friends to the ASP Institute and to me and my wife, Karen. And we can't thank you enough for all that you mean to the Institute. Now, I'd like to again, thank everyone who has joined us for the Gildenhorn book series for a very memorable 17 years. Keep reading. We wish you all the very best. Thank you.